Here we go. Welcome. Uh-huh. There we go. Start off. You feel relaxed now? All right. I know some some of us are, you know, we're, we're comfortable with doing stuff like that. Others may not. I don't know where you are in there on that. Um, I'm always accused of being on the go that I don't know how to sit still in one spot. And um, those pause and reflection type act activities, that's a challenge for me. You know, be honest with you, that is, that's a challenge. And that's something that I could probably do a way better job at doing. But again, here, welcome, welcome back. Um, seems like uh, a long time uh, has passed. Uh, spring break seems to be epically long, uh, at least from my perspective. Seems as long as last year's. Not as long as last year's. That is true. That is true. You beat me to it, Smurf. I was going to say. I think that spring break had been going on for a very long time. I mean, I still distinctly remember I'm at, I'm at the Minnesota twins game at Fort Myers and I get a text message about uh, shutdowns and changes that, that, that is occurring. My, my son at, at the university of Minnesota saying, well, it looks like my spring break has been extended. And I'm like, well, so has mine. And did not realize at the time, but I was actually at the last, uh, in 2020, the last Minnesota Twins spring training game because Major League Baseball had shut down spring training at that time. So, yes, a lot has transpired over that past year. It's amazing. That's all I can say. So, um, now you may have thought what Miss Stretch was what had done was the wellness activity, but no, it's not. All right, we still got we still got a little bit more here. We got still a little bit more here to do. So. Um, I'm just going to be consistent, kind of like what I've done, you know, uh, for the past uh, several months is kind of lay out the agenda. And so we have a little wellness activity. I want to give some highlights to 3.1 after the activity, and then we'll move on to uh, that dynamic figure as a uh, model. Um, so we will continue with an authoritarian uh, study unit here. Um, seating chart, I'm letting you decide. So where you're sitting right now, I just made note. That is uh, your seating chart. And so um, just just remember, tomorrow, that's where you are right now. That's where you're sitting. And those who are absent will just fill in those empty spots there. So, but I should have, uh, in theory, every seat filled. Okay? So we have that. All right. Any questions before we start? Yeah. Yes, we have in person tomorrow. So that that's a really good good point. Um, we no longer are in the A B model. Um, we are full uh, in person. Uh, so that means every day except on Friday, which is Flex Friday. Um, but tomorrow's not a Flex Friday. It's a in person um, Friday. And so. Uh, if you thought today might have been like an A or a B day. Uh, and you're sitting at home, you just want to make sure that you, you get here uh, on, uh, on your, well, get here uh, since we no longer are on, the, are on that AB mode. All right. Yeah, and well, as well as uh, the VLA students are expected to be here every day as, as well, because we are going live, all that. So that's why I'm over here in my little corner. Did I move some things around here so I can be in my corner and not obstruct views or anything like that. So there we go. All right, so with that, let's, let's just dig in here. Um, normalizing your feelings, that's what Mr. Etch was working on a little bit here, normalizing our feelings. Um, and we've had that, we had a little lockout. You've had that moment to do a little self check-in where you feel zero to five, very, very happy and all that stuff. Um, I always strive, try to strive for protection, uh, perfection. So I'm never going to pick that, that, that far extreme. So maybe about four. I feel like, you know, I'm at four. I'm feeling happy, all that stuff. Happy because, you know, I'm just back at it. Um, even during this time where we were away for distant learning, um, I still found myself coming in uh, every day. Oh, and uh, sometimes there was 
a few colleagues around me and other times they weren't, but, um, you know, I just felt, you know, just glad to be able to continue to do what I was doing. So there we go. All right, little inclusion activity, here we go. In Schoology, um, you will find in, in a moment here, a, a Google form. And for those at home, I put into the chat the Google form, but you can also go into Schoology and you'll see in the current folder. So if I share my tab there, uh, it's a uh, COVID survey. And that COVID survey is going to look like this. Okay, it's gonna look something like this. And it's just, just a couple of questions uh, to kind of get you to reflect on uh, past several weeks or months, you know, during COVID. You know, did you have a song uh, or a, um, you know, a song that helped you cope during COVID or a song that best represents your COVID experience? And I think, you know, as I was listening on uh, the radio, the current primarily, Amazing the amount of songs that were coming out related to the quarantine. It's incredible. Um, and some of them are very uplifting, and some of them are like, okay, you know, highlighting uh, the woes of, of the pandemic as well. Okay, uh, also think about, you know, what was either your favorite food or snack that helped you cope during COVID? And what was either your favorite movie or show that helped you? cope during uh, COVID as well. So hopefully if those at home are, are filling that out as well. So let's just take a moment, do that. I suppose I could have changed that and just say, you know, favorite group. Maybe it's not just a song, but maybe a group that could get you through, through it. So by filling it out, that'd be great. Tomorrow I will share um, uh, what uh, people's favorite songs and food and, and movie or show was. All right, so while you're working on that, I would say, you know, for me, song, that's where I would say if it was a group. Because anytime, you know, I feel like I need a little pick-me-up or anything like that, I got to put on my Red Hot Chili Peppers. Bottom line, I always got to do that. Um, I don't care how old I'll get, it's always going to be the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Always going to be that. You know, get to that higher ground, whatever it might be. Um, so a little Red Hot Chili Pepper. For uh, food... Uh, my daughter, uh, it seemed like to be her favorite because she knew like when I would be going up the steps into the kitchen, open up the pantry, she knows exactly what I was going to do. I'm going to get some Ritz. Bottom line, again, that might be uh, an old thing, but um, Ritz, Ritz crackers. But of course, I think you could probably all figure out what am I going to uh, drink with my Ritz? Oh, geez, water. <laughs> Diet Coke, man. Ritz and Diet Coke, man. Ritz and Diet Coke. You know, it, it, I, might start off, I might start off with like five Ritz, five Ritz, and then I'll and have my Diet Coke, and then it's like, oh, got to go up there and get some more. So Ritz, definitely, definitely it. You know, if, if, if we did have Girl Scout cookies in the house, it probably would be the Thin Mints uh, with Diet Coke. Um, to me, everything just goes with Diet Coke, but. Um, I have a strong stomach. Um, someone's at the door. All right.
And then for movies, movies and stuff like that, um, or, or shows, I'm going to say, you know, that, that, that's a little bit harder one, but uh, I'm always, you know, Mandalorian was a good one for me to get. Well, that was that was on WandaVision, just got done. Um, and now I got sucked into Designated Survivor on, on Netflix. So um, those would be it. But uh, Miss I knows or anyone knows that if um, all of a sudden I'm channel surfing and if the if Godfather pops on, I'll watch it. Godfather one, two, three, even though I don't, three is kind of weak compared to one and two. Um, 16 candles, stuff like that. But I would say those, those, those recent series were probably the big ones as well. All right. So here we go. Schedule. We see our schedule. Uh, we got to 950 today, uh, for our, our period one here and got 10 minute passing time. See period two, 10 to 11, 15. And uh, period three, it all depends on your lunch. All right. Yes. Um, how, do we, how do we check them? Sure. Uh, second hour, your teacher's going to uh, talk about that. Or at some point in the hour, you can walk over to my cabinet and I have it posted as well. Is it based off your second hour? Or third, hour? third hour teacher. Based on your third hour. All right. Yep. All right, and virtual learning Fridays. Well, we won't have one this Friday, but you, you see that uh, next Friday is a virtual learning Friday. So expectation was everyone tunes in at nine o'clock. All right, because I, I do anticipate using most of, of uh, the Fridays for some type of instruction, all right? If not, I'll, I'll send out a message and say, you know, we're not gonna have a Google Meet, all that, okay? All right, questions on that? All right, this doesn't necessarily totally apply to you, except maybe the 13th, uh, where we won't have school for, um, you know, for uh, 9, 10, and, and uh, 12th graders. Woo! Um, so these are just some testing dates here. Uh, that will be going on. So just uh, be just be conscious of the 13th there, April 13th, which is a Tuesday. All right. And if you need uh, support and all that stuff, um, wellness. You know, there, there, there are a number of individuals in at, at Park High that that be willing to help out with you. Uh, talk with uh, whatever is is on your mind. Um, Counselors, uh, the wellness. Uh, we heard uh, Miss uh, uh, Strash uh, talk earlier. Uh, so just just know that these uh, services are there, okay? And you have a little Wolfpack icon on your iPad that can help you there. All right. So uh, we know that the next couple of days, uh, you maybe feel a lot of different emotions and all that stuff. All right, uh, for a lot of different reasons. And so if you need that support again, um, always reach out, always reach out, okay? Whether it's stuff that's going on here at school or out in uh, the greater community as well, because we got some dynamic stuff happening, okay? Safety reminders, uh, if this is your first time in the building, you've been in hybrid since the beginning, please remember and practice these. The big thing here is uh, just make sure that you're following the protocols. Mask on, wear it properly, wash your hands, sanitize, all that. Follow the arrows, as Mr. Herber had talked about. Uh, practice some distancing. Uh, in theory, uh, way the desks are set up, uh, we should have appropriate amount of distance, but we can always make some adjustments with that. Sometimes I think... Uh, they have uh, short people like me in mind when they create the distance and um, someone like my son who's over like 6'2", uh, is not taken into consideration when we look at the distancing and all that stuff. So, all right. So there we go. All right, so with that, uh, any questions or concerns? 
either here or at home, any questions or concerns before we start and dig in? Don't. All right. Okay. So with that, um, we are trimester 3.1 is going to be a little different than uh, that was initially planned. Um, because the idea in 3.1 initially was we were going to prep for an IB exam. All right. All right. But now, but now that's not happening, right? So it's all based on your internal assessment and predicted score. And I think everyone here has those who have registered for the IB exam. I've also have your IA. Uh, if not, I, I, I would have been in contact with you and I've got to get those out. Um, well, I, I myself have already uploaded uh, the, the IAs that I have into um, uh, the uh, IB organization. So they have, they have histories there and predicted scores and all that stuff. So, uh, so we, we got a little shift, a little change. And so um, that just means that the authoritarian unit uh, will continue and have another layer added to it. And a topic that we were going to cover last year in 11th grade, but that became a um, on the chopping block when all of a sudden we went to emergency learning. And it was a topic that I was going to bring back uh, in 12th grade anyhow, and that is we're going to look at that, that sexy topic called Cold War. Looking at the Cold War, the beginning to uh, the end. Sometimes we focus on the beginning, but we don't quite see how it comes to an end. And there are some of us in here in, in the social studies department that uh, look back at the Cold War with a kind of a strange nostalgic feeling that, all right, we survived the Cold War. That would be myself, Mr. Ryan, and Mr. Moran. Finally look back at that, um, Ms. Johnson as well. Um, at least we were of um, adult age during uh, the, uh, the Cold War. We have some on staff that were not, and were maybe elementary aged during uh, the Cold War time period. So that will finish us out for 3.3.1. So those are our two big things there. All right. Questions, comments, or concerns related to that. Okay. So Mao, we're going to pick up with the authoritarians. In 2.1 and 2.2, we looked at uh, authoritarians, Hitler and Stalin. And I think, you know, you look back at them and you rated them pretty high as authoritarians. I mean, they were hovering on a scale of one to 10 um, around eight. Uh, maybe Hitler got a little higher higher rating than, than Joseph Stalin. So now here we have Mao, and we got to figure out if Mao uh, can hang uh, with authoritarian, uh, authoritarians like Hitler and Stalin. So uh, starting today to next Friday, um, that is going to be our focus is on uh, Chairman Mao. He is a very unique individual. All right. What I want to do is I can start off here with a welcome back uh, video on Mao. And we're going to look at that. It's about 11 minutes. They call him the peasant emperor. Call him the peasant emperor, even though uh, we wouldn't think of a communist chairman as a emperor. But in many ways in, in China, um, lack of democracy, lack of any type of one would say democratic structures and stuff like that they've always been led by a strong leader and so um mao would be no different than than the traditions here what i want you to think about though is when we look at authoritarians what are the influencing factors what is influencing them and what kind of characters do they have? Heck, you know, we talk about here, Park I, I, you know, the ICC, you know, as, as um, 
kind of defining our, our character and, and our, you know, um, what is supposed to drive us daily here? You know, what is the characteristics? What are the influences that are driving Chairman Mao? All right. So we'll watch this and then we'll see if we can get some takeaways from it um, on either the characteristics or the influencing factors. All right. Maybe we can find some commonalities between Mao and some of these other ones as well. All right. So with that, let me get this thing started. Mao Zedong brought the communist revolution to China and gained political power through the barrel of a gun. The Chinese system he overthrew nearly 50 years ago was backward and corrupt. Few would argue the fact that he dragged China into the 20th century, but at a cost in human lives that is staggering. Suspected enemies of the party were murdered by the millions. Farming collectives and the great leap forward of industrialization that failed miserably and left millions more dead from starvation. Mao left a system of oppression that continues to this day, even as China moves forward with economic reforms and toward the central position on the world stage. For 25 years, Mao Zedong ruled one quarter of the world's population. He turned China from a feudal backwater into one of the most powerful countries in the world. I would say he was a genius. Even those who oppose him, who curse him, would say the same. But behind a wall of silence, we know he presided over the deaths of tens of millions of his countrymen. Mao was more like Stalin than Hitler, but he was responsible for many more deaths than either of them. He ruled as an emperor, but remained a simple man. We know that he didn't like to wash, that he was rubbed down with wet towels every night. We know that he never brushed his teeth. He was a peasant. This is the story of a man who was praised in his lifetime as a god, but may be judged in the future as one of the bloodiest dictators of the 20th century. China, the last important bastion of communism in the world. For more than 50 years, the country's history has been dominated by the shadow of one man, Mao Zedong. He's still revered as the founding father of modern China, the man who turned Marxism into Maoism and gave the Chinese people a new dignity and self-respect. People believe that Mao Zedong could bring happiness to them. There's a popular song called The East is Red, which goes, The East is Red, Sun is Risen. Mao Zedong has appeared in China. Mao came from a peasant family. His parents and grandparents before them owned a three and a half acre plot of land in the village of Shaoshan Chan. It's a small hamlet in the province of Hunan in southern China. It was here, in a house which is now a museum, that Mao was born on December 26, 1893. China was a feudal society where a small elite lived well and millions barely survived. In 
the cities, opium addiction was widespread. In the countryside, feudal landlords ruled like kings and extorted punitive taxes. There were frequent peasant rebellions, which were bloodily suppressed. Life was tough and brutal. Mao's family were better off than many. His father, Mao Jen Shen, was a self-made man with a temper who believed in the virtues of hard work and often beat his sons. Mao and his two younger brothers were much happier with their mother, Wen Chi Mei, an illiterate, devout Buddhist who tried to shelter them. Mao was very close to his mother. He would spend a lot of time arguing with his father. In his old age, when he went back to visit his parents' graves, Mao said his mother had been more important to him than his father. By the age of six, the young Mao was already toiling for long hours in his father's fields. He got a brief education, but by the time he was 13, he was working full time on the family farm he grew increasingly restless. He lacked adequate education, and then he also had an inordinate ambition. And uh, this is a pretty volatile combination, and he really didn't know what to do with himself. But he always had uh, a voracious appetite for reading and a kind of spirit of radical adventure. When he was 14, his father arranged for him to marry a local girl. But Mao knew by now that he wanted to escape the confines of village life, and he never accepted or lived with her. Three years later, when he was 17, he finally left home and caught a boat to the bustling regional capital of Changsha, where he planned to enroll in a proper school. Almost immediately, he found himself caught up in a revolution. For years, China had been ruled by a corrupt and ineffectual monarchy. The country was falling apart. The monarchy was now overthrown by a modernizing republican movement, headed by the Kuomintang, or Nationalist Party. Mao reveled in the upheaval. Though in Shangsha, there was relative calm. He enrolled in a teacher training college, but as a gesture of support for the rebellion, cut off his traditional Chinese pigtail, until then a capital offense. There were roving bands of bandits. It was a time when a patriotic youth, and Mao was certainly that, wandered with a China. He joined a student group and dreamed of a new China. He believed in the importance of physical well-being. We know this because one of his friends from his youth wrote a book about their life together and how Mao had persuaded him and a few others to tramp across the countryside during the holidays, crossing streams and going up mountains because he felt that if patriotic young people were going to save China, they had to be healthy and strong in order to do it. In 1918, he qualified as a teacher. He was 24. In the same year, his much-loved mother died. Mao had no incentive to go home and left for the capital, Beijing, to look for a job. The city was full of young men trying to make a living. Mao had difficulty finding work. He eventually found a lowly job at the university and moved into a room in a poor part of the city, which he shared with seven other people. Mao was an assistant in the Beijing library. And I think for him, this was as close as he could get to a university education. Um, he was treated with a derision by the other students, by the students. 
he also, um, I think, was extremely frustrated by the level of this position. It was now, mingling with the students, that Mao heard about the communist revolution in Russia. He was fascinated by it. It seemed to offer new hope for the downtrodden peasants of his own country. Mao became a revolutionary Marxist and an inaugural member of the Chinese Communist Party. It was a small group that got together, and Mao was there as a sort of representative of the uncouth masses, you might say. Um, nobody took him seriously at all. Mao returned to his home province of Hunan to preach communism to the peasants. With him, he took his new wife, the daughter of one of his old school teachers. But there was little time for family life. China was now run by a fierce anti-communist called Chiang Kai-shek. In 1927, he clamped down on his radical opponents. Thousands of communist supporters were brutally rounded up. Many were beaten and shot. Mao fled with his family and a straggling band of communists to the remote and inaccessible mountains of Jiangxi in southern China, a place he knew from his youth. He was in his late 30s, a marked man with a price on his head of a quarter of a million silver dollars. He was about to emerge as the most important revolutionary figure in China. All right, so um, there you have it, uh, a young Mao in his 30s, revolutionary Mao in his 30s. Sometimes we don't think of these individuals um, as, as young uh, when it's all going down. Um, you know, when we think of our own, our own revolution, uh, you've got, you know, someone like a Thomas Jefferson who's in his late 20s. Uh, John Adams is in his 30s. Uh, so uh, there, these moments in time, they're very, very, I guess we would say, young in, in age. Mao is, is no different there. Um, there, there is some of this is review because you know again we 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 looked at this in the Chinese Civil War um, case study, but uh, maybe maybe some other things have popped up that um, could explain a little bit about Mao. What were some of the influencing factors, or maybe some of his characteristics that kind of stood out? What do you got? He is a rebel. He is a rebel. Yes, and it seems like he's been a rebel from the beginning. Um, rebel, restless, sort of ambitious. ambitious, ambitious. Okay. Those are good. Good. Um, rebel, ambitious. What else? What do you got? Passion for reading. Passion for reading. Um, and in many ways, I could, that is going to, um, open up the doors uh, to a whole array of p perhaps alternative ways of approaching society. Go ahead. Ability to persuade people. He was. He was uh, 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 charismatic in that way. Able to persuade. Convince people of his views. What else? Anything odd about him? Or maybe I should say different. What's that? Okay, okay. Um, uncaring, aloof in some ways. Not that he wasn't married. I believe I believe Mao might have gone through two or three marriages. Go ahead. Um, well. Chinese 
Yes, that's a good point, that he was not um, in that tradition of the family. Is that what you're getting at? And so we will see in the Cultural Revolution that will happen in the 60s, one of the, the, the institutions that he wants to change or be attacked is uh, the, the tradition, the family tradition. Um, it's all part of reshaping, rechanging China. Go ahead. Um, I think he really falls apart. I would say he knows exactly what he wants. He knows what he wants. Like, uh, when he, before he left for the first time, he said he uh, didn't marry that one girl. Um, uh, that says a lot about his character. And then it also says a lot how he like, came back to his own land and was married to a girl from the same, but I don't know, it would be considered. Uh, same area, same area. Uh, we weren't necessarily going to speak in, in terms of, of, of tribes, but region, um, maybe linguistic group. Uh, it, what he does publicly and what he does privately might be two different things. But we'll, there'll, there'll be some contradictions. But again, I, I understand. I totally understand your point there. What you're getting at, um, of course, you know some of those things that always kind of stand out too. That uh, when we look at the family, uh, he had he was closer to his his mother than father. So if we want to look for some commonalities, um, Hitler, Stalin, same kind of profile. They had difficult relationships with the, with the, with their dads. Um, Ma seems to be more of the, the rock uh, holding holding them together. Uh, and something usually tragic happens then to, to mom in, in, in the process there. Um, but influencing, he is coming of age in a time of revolutions. And that is gonna be a big influencer here. And he does have a vision for China that is trying to get rid of foreign influence as well. So all that's gonna play a part here. All right, um, I do have a few thoughts here that I also wanna share and I'll go through them rather quickly because again, it's just more of a review, kind of bring us back to when we, we looked at China uh, pre-Chinese Civil War and then um, we'll have a few minutes uh, near the end here to kind of debrief and, and relax and get ready for that next, that next uh, class period. Okay, so I have a copy of these uh, in Schoology, so you can follow along. Um, and I just noticed in the chat here, uh, interesting that he was a peasant, like even though he ruled as a ruler, that, that, that is very true. Uh, simplicity, if we look at communist China, uh, uh, the focus on uh, the simplistic, um, values and uh, just way of life, uh, if we want to look at that, is this going to be prevalent? So I do have a copy of these notes you can find in Schoology, uh, just to kind of guide, uh, and it'll be in the presentation folder. And so when we look at China prior to, you know, Mao and even some of the other revolutionaries, uh, up to the 20th century, China is uh, suffering from lack of unity and political and it's politically unstable. Uh, and you could throw in economically, it's a crisis state as well. Uh, you look at the lack of unity, you know, we talk about the warlords, we talk about the region, China's very vast. It's carved up by uh, foreign influence and their little spheres of influence and the uh, Qin dynasty no longer is capable of protecting China here. And uh, the reforms that may have been put in place are too little and. And, and too late and don't go uh, far enough here. There was a revolution that, that had occurred uh, in uh, 1911, 1912. Uh, Sun Yat-sen is associated with that. He is sometimes considered uh, like the father of, of China. Even the communists uh, look at Sun Yat-sen. But um, Sun Yat-sen is gonna lose uh, control to uh, Yuan uh, Shikai and he, pretty much forms his own, one could say, a military dictatorship. So whatever um, momentum that was created by the creation of a republic 
is lost by uh, this new leader, Yuan Shikai. And uh, he proves to be just as ineffective as uh, the previous leaders of China had been. And when he dies uh, and, and leaves um, uh, as head of the Republic, it, it breaks down again. <laughs> So if you're 916 student, it's time to exit. Yeah. Just follow along on Schoology and stuff. Yep. Okay. All right. So it breaks down into warlordism and uh, the central government is not effective at all here in trying to really be the administrator of, of China. So again, we've talked about the warlords here and uh, the, the very powerful generals uh, control their, their region. It is this time though that the communists and the Kuomintang, uh, two main groups, the nationalist groups that had already been formed are gonna work together in that first United Alliance to kind of take on um, uh, the warlords and succeed. And then once that gets done in about 1927, 28, uh, the nationalists or the Guomitang uh, is just going to uh, proclaim that they are the legitimate rulers of, of China. And that is Jiang Jeshi in my day, we call him Chai Kai Shek. So um, with that, then Mao, uh, when we look at Mao here, what kind of stands out is he is part of the Communist Party, but um, he is not necessarily the, the the dominant figure here. He is just like one of many in the Chinese Communist Party here. And it is this violence that um, led him to believe that the only way um, to really get China um, moving in a modernizing direction is they're going to have to use extreme me methods, extreme methods here. The Chinese Communist Party was established in 1921, but we know that Mao, again, was not necessarily uh, the dominant figure. Formed in um, uh, uh, Shanghai and um, and it's mainly there in the urban area, but it's gonna, uh, Mao's vision for, for the Communist Party is going to be that of not the norm. So his ideology centered on the importance of the peasant, where if we look at uh, the traditional communism, they put the emphasis on the industrial worker. So this was not consistent with mainstream thinking. So he's gonna battle those 28, that group that is known as the 28 Bolsheviks, they are the Moscow trained. Um, Mao's ideas, though, ideology seems to be more pragmatic. Knowing that we, this is the system that they have, they're going to have to work with it. So that's why um, uh, peasants is going to be the, the main vehicle here. And um, guerrilla warfare is going to be also a key element for Mao's uh, methods as well. Uh, Mao's ideology became defined during the time in uh, Zhang Chi, or Zhang Chai, uh, and the communists were forced to set up a base and form the Red Army to defend themselves against uh, the GMD, which is the Guomintang, led by uh, Zhang Jeshi. All right. Um, Mao is going to emerge as a leader of China here. And this is where, again, I think way back uh, in when we're studying the Chinese Civil War, I look at this picture and again, I think of a boy band. Here they are. These guys are in their late 20s, early 30s. Um, they're ready to rock and roll here with the, with the Chinese Civil War. Um, the Long March is what's going to make Mao. And the long march is going to be critical for him consolidating his control of the Communist Party. 
And anyone after the Chinese Civil War who wants to be part of the Politburo, who wants to be a leader, they got to, in some ways, attach themselves to Mao in the Long March. They got to have that connective piece there. So this guy right here, Cho In Lai, is going to be a very incredible, uh, uh, important figure for Mao and for the moderates in China. So they established a new base in uh, uh, Yuan, where Mao became the undisputed leader. And a lot of that is through what we call the rectification campaign. Basically, it's a nice way of saying purge. Got rid of his opponents. Uh, so everyone could have what they call revolutionary correctness. And to achieve revolutionary correctness, you might have to um, have self-criticism. You got to study the prescribed text and avoid revisionist ideas, which basically means avoid having any idea that's different than Mao. All right. Um, it is the second uh, Sino-Japanese War that brings, uh, once again, a, a united front with the GMD and the communists. Um, but we know during that unification kind of uh, moment, Mao really wasn't a team player. You know, the, the formula 70, 20, 10. Expand influence 70%, expand territory, uh, spend 20% focusing on the, the GMD and 10% on the Japanese themselves. All right, on the Japanese and trying to uh, be a partner in that united front. When the war got over, it was game on. And we know that uh, the GMD is going to lose and that the communists uh, will win in 1949. And Mao is the main leader. And a lot of it has to do with his leadership, has to do with uh, the support of the peasants, has to do with transforming his army from a guerrilla to a conventional army, um, and oppor very opportunistic, very opportunistic. And his opponents, well, they just totally miss, uh, um, miss their, their moments to uh, take advantage of Mao's weakness. And after um, 1945, uh, there weren't going to be many moments of weakness for Mao. So with that, Mao emerges as a leader, and he's going to work on creating uh, the People's Republic of China now. And it's going to take not a few years. It's going to take a number of years, if not decades to create the type of China that Mao is looking at. All right, so with that, um, anyone have any uh, follow-up uh, questions uh, based on these notes or any follow-ups and thoughts about Mao? Yep. Um, so you said that um, how did Mao's pull of personality contribute to this? How did his personality? You know, the, the fact that he uh, was a very effective uh, communicator and he was very pragmatic in his views uh, that uh, he was able to, knowing at the time for his revolution to succeed, uh, he is not only going to need the help of the peasants, but he is also going to need uh, the help of uh, the middle class and, and maybe some of those wealthier peasants in in. in so Union, they would be called uh, kulaks, um, but they are just very successful um, peasant farmers. He realizes he needs them, uh, and he has able to showcase that he's a nationalist first, which is what the Chinese are looking for, uh, whether it is with uh, Chai Kai-shek or, or Jing Jeshi or with Mao. Um, he is a nationalist. But he also has a communist uh, ideology with it. But he's able to uh, effectively communicate, um, speak on what the Chinese people are looking for, because he's very pragmatic. Even though, as we look at hindsight, we know that in some cases it might be window dressing, very much like what Adolf Hitler 
was um, saying that might have seemed very socialist in mind. It was mainly more window dressing to suck people in. Good points. All right. Um, any others? All right. My final thought here for you, and then I'll give you some time, is um, we got some focus questions here, and that they're going to be due tomorrow. And so I've had these open for a little while, but um, these might be the first time you looked at them. Okay. And so what we're looking at is really his rise to power a little bit more, but also how he's beginning to consolidate his power too. All right. And that is going to be very important. Again, uh, just like for Hitler and Stalin, this idea of a cult of personality. Um, there's going to be a strong cult of personality that's going to be created here about Mao. So we really need to look at that. Okay. And so we are going to be using um, uh, in, in our textbook, we're going to use chapter three. All right. So you shouldn't have to GTS it. So you should be able to just to use uh, chapter three uh, to guide you in this process. All right. So that will be our focus. And then tomorrow we're going to take a look at um, how he actually goes about creating the, the, the PRC, People's Republic of, of China. Okay. With a little activity piece. Any questions or thoughts, concerns? All right. For those at home, you, you can exit and you have a 